Yeah. I think we can uh, at least uh, start okay. if you agree, Pavel. So, uh, so welcome everybody to this um, uh, Quid Ultra Colloquium. And uh, Professor Roberto Capuzzo Dolcetta will, um, will give an introduction to our speaker today, who is uh, Pavel Krupa. Okay. Thank you, Raffaella. And thanks, Pavel, for being here. Here, I mean, uh, <laughs> in, a, in a picture, but we appreciate it anyway. So it is a pleasure for me to introduce Professor Pavel Krupa. Uh, that I knew, I guess, it was the uh, beginning of uh, uh, 2000 or so in Heidelberg, probably, when I was been visiting uh, some other people in Heidelberg, and I guess this was the first time I met Pavel there. He was a, a young boy, <laughs> while I was just a little older than him. <laughs> And I had the chance to talk about some scientific things and not just scientific things. And so I say, first of all, that I appreciate him very much, not just as a scientist, but for his open mindedness in many things that we have had the chance to talk about. So I'm really happy he's going to give us a talk. So a short resume and uh, Pavel, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, Pavel uh, uh, studies for his in undergraduate studies in Australia, uh, near Perth, or in Perth. And he studied mathematics and physics at the time before going to UK in uh, um, Cambridge, where uh, he studied for his PhD in the same uh, Trinity College, where Isaac Newton, few centuries before, <laughs> <laughs> was active <laughs> and so he's coming from a prestigious place indeed and after that I guess that his first postdoc position was uh, in Heidelberg in 2000 or, or so and uh, he got a professorship position in Kiel in Germany in 2004 if I'm right and uh, uh, after that he got also a sort of uh, guest professorship in, in Prague, where he is now uh, together with uh, working in, in Bonn. Uh, his scientific career, his scientific work has been covering a huge field of theoretical and not just theoretical astrophysics. I particularly um, like to remember his uh, Krupa mass function, which was uh, one of the most important achievements in the study of the distribution of stars in cluster and in other places of, of star formation after the Salpeter and Miller scale uh, mass function. But uh, I particularly appreciate his uh, person, I particularly appreciate his uh, critical vision of dark matter. I don't want to say that I am so against the dark matter as he is, but I have a lot of doubts about everything which is beyond the Occam's razor. So what is not really needed is best not to be introduced. By the way, I, I now uh, stop it because I think it's too long. And I just say that today is not going to speak about dark matter, but it's going to speak about supermassive black hole formation, like the title say. Grazie, Pavel, and we are proud to listen to you. Well, thank you so much for this very kind introduction. And it's a great pleasure to see you, Roberto. So I have, uh, I have something for you later in the talk. You will see. <laughs> Good. So um, I hope my cursor is visible. Yes, it is. Okay. Great. OK, so um, I would like to share with the audience um, <clears throat> some uh, recent theoretical work which um, we did on the formation of supermassive black holes and um, I'd like to state that this uh, project uh, began in about 2008 with the work of Jörg Dabringhausen and um, that it was finally published at least a major part of it um, prior to the Black Hole Nobel Prize of 2020 which means that um, this work which which I will be representing today 
which also constitutes a review. Um, uh, the, in, in that work, there was no influence and no corruption whatsoever um, through through this Nobel Prize uh, event. So this um, um, work I'm um, reporting here um, happened prior to that and was in no way influenced by that uh, prize. Um, and so it's based on this publication. So it was in August uh, uh, 2020 um, by um, by this team of people, by Ladislav Schubert, Teresa Rabkova, and uh, Long Wang. Uh, and um, let me begin then with an introduction. Uh, so if you look at the Milky Way from the top, we can see that the sun is precisely here, and that's the bar. Uh, and uh, this uh, um, a galaxy, you can see here the spatial scale, has a supermassive black hole at the very center of it, which weighs some 4 million uh, solar masses. If we zoom in onto the center, uh, one finds the inner part of the central star cluster. Uh, you can see here the scale of 0.2 parsecs. Um, and um, there we have um, the centralmost part, which is the um, the S stars containing contained here with the famous S two star, and the team in Garching has been producing a fabulous work, in particular uh, this movie over um, uh, sixteen years of observations. One can see how these stars on the scale. You can see here now the scale of 0.05 parsec. So there's a very very center of the of the Milky Way, which is very difficult to read, but I can only do that through infrared because of all the dust obscuration. Um, so one can see here the motion of the stars. And this famous star S2, you can see is on a very eccentric orbit, and then it moves around sharply, and that's uh, from such measurements, and you can see there are quite a few other stars which are moving in a similar way. So from such measurements, one obtains um, a, mass, a mass measurement of a dark object about where the Kursa is now, uh, which which corresponds to this mass up here of about four million solar masses. Now, this um, a movie also very nicely um, demonstrates how how difficult it is to define a inertial reference frame, right? Because everything is moving, everything. So even um, if you look out at, out at the night sky, it looks static to us, but of course, on the astronomical time scales, it's a very dynamic uh, system, and everything is moving. And so the astronomers have been spending a very, very, very huge effort in trying to establish some reference frame with which one can measure such motions, with respect to which one, one can measure uh, such such motions. Um, so, um, if you now look at this galaxy M87, which is um, a giant elliptical galaxy in scale, about in scale, you can see the Milky Way here. Um, this is a bigger galaxy, uh, much more massive, and again, at its center is a supermassive black hole, just in this time, it's about a thousand times more massive than that of the Milky Way. Now, that has also uh, received um, some fame in the um, media through this um, um, shadow of the black hole, which was uh, observed with the uh, Event Horizon Telescope collaboration, so that is a, a so these people have um, joined um, radio telescopes um, across the whole Earth uh, to create a telescope, synthesized synthetic telescope, which is um, uh, the, the size of the planet. And with that, they achieved this incredible uh, spatial resolution, such that they can measure um, in that galaxy um, this uh, ring of emitting material uh, and the innermost shadow has a span of about 650 AU. So this ring is a plasma of uh, some 10 to the 10 Kelvin, which is uh, orbiting relativistically around here. <clears throat> and the black hole, um, the, Sch the Schwarzschild radius is roughly one third of this dimension. So one is really approached from Earth a, um, a, a next to a basically nearly direct image of an actual uh, supermassive black hole. Um, and that is a most astonishing feat, of course. So why is there a shadow? So this is just a very small, sh sh nice little cartoon just to show what is meant um, um, for the students. Uh, so we have here a, a relativistic disk. It's emitting um, and therefore blue, um, it's extremely hot, but if we now put a supermassive black hole into this, it uh, redshifts the light, and of course more and more so towards the black hole, and that's why we don't actually see anything, because the photons are trapped, they, uh, they are on all sorts of orbits, but they don't actually propagate any more from this region to the observer, while here they do, more or less, but still um, redshifted. 
now it's um, rotating uh, very very rapidly so um, this uh, Doppler boost uh, emission towards the observer and that brightens that particular part of the room and the, all of this is the physics of this the detailed physics is discussed in this uh, research paper who which which uh, anybody can of course go and, and look at for more details so that explains this observation and we therefore have very firm evidence for the existence of these um, uh, supermassive black holes so here's now um, a plot um, of the uh, central massive object, so that's a, a supermassive black hole or the central cluster in the galaxy. And this is the mass of the galaxy, of the spheroid. So if it's a disk galaxy, we're looking at the uh, bulge of the galaxy, or if it's an elliptical, it's just, it's just the whole elliptical. And we've just seen that the Milky Way um, has a mass ar uh, around that value. Um, so the supermassive black hole has a mass around that value, and its bulge mass is about there a few times 10 to the 10 solar masses while uh, the um, M87 is uh, correspondingly a more massive elliptical galaxy and has this very massive supermassive black hole weighing uh, nearly 10 to the 10 solar masses. Uh, and so these are two cases which are now very well confirmed, but of course there are many other measurements uh, using various techniques. Um, so measuring this mass is comparatively easy, measuring the central massive object is of course harder, but uh, this has been achieved, so the red uh, points here are supermassive black hole masses, while the uh, blue uh, crosses are uh, uh, star clusters. Uh, now, interesting is what this is what what uh, Weiner and Harris has pointed out, and the later this was uh, readdressed by uh, Capucho Dolcetta and Tosta Emelo um, that um, in this regime of the spheroidal mass, there seems to be no supermassive black hole but a central star cluster while in this more massive regime there seems to be a supermassive black hole which is in a central star cluster but the supermassive black hole doesn't seem to exist in this regime and so that's an interesting observation which needs an explanation apart from also of course trying to understand why there's this correlation and so in this regime there's no supermassive black hole but only a central cluster that's a very interesting clue uh, which might come out or might not come out of the theory of the formation of supermassive black holes until now it was not explained why there should be this uh, type of difference now just as a little reminder um, spatial scale so we have the uh, event horizon uh, which is just that um, uh, region around the uh, point mass from which photons can't escape. So um, in the uh, Milky Way, Milky Way case is this one here. There we have um, um, about a, a horizon of 0.1 AU, and uh, in M87 case where we have this um, 10 to the more than 10 to the 9 solar mass supermassive black hole. We have something like 100 or so AU uh, horizon, um, ra radius for the horizon. Then there's also the black hole influence radius, um, and that is that if you have a stellar system like a star cluster or a, a bulge, which has a certain velocity dispersion, for example, it could be 200 kilometers per second, then this radius tells us at, at, which, at which distance from the center the supermassive black hole starts to dominate the motions of the stars. And so, for example, for a globular cluster with a velocity dispersion of 10 kilometers per second, if it, if it would have an intermediate mass black hole of 10,000 solar masses, that influence radius would be 0.45 parsecs. So that's just as an, a little example. Now, such black holes have not yet been conclusively uh, found. So um, another um, problem one has to try to solve, or at least it should come out of a theory of the formation of supermassive black holes, is that these um, supermassive black holes appear at an extremely high redshift, right? So if this is uh, here the time axis, and this is where the um, black, uh, Big Bang uh, happened, and then time progresses towards us, uh, where we are now, uh, at the present somewhere over here, the first stars are thought to form at about 200 million years after uh, the actual Big Bang, because the gas needs time to, to cool and then to collapse. Um, and then, so this axis continues, you see here we have 12.6 uh, billion years uh, ago, one now sees the pickup of quasars. So um, these are the brightest quasars and these are the faintest quasars in the survey. These are intermediate bright quasars and one sees that as one proceeds towards a time uh, at the present and up here you've got the redshift, uh, the number of quasars per co-moving volume, so the number density of these um, increases with time. 
Um, and so that has to be understood. They come at a very high redshift. And in fact, even at a, uh, an even larger redshift, so there was this object uh, called, uh, well, it, was, it has this Hawaiian name here, uh, because it, it was found uh, from Hawaiian telescopes, um, and it is a, um, a quasar which is found at a redshift of 7.5, um, weighing already 1.5 times 10 to the 9 solar masses, and it is existing at about 700 million years after the Big Bang. And so this is a true problem on how to find these uh, film form such objects. So for example, if one would start some magically with a 10 to the 4 solar mass black hole, um, to reach this mass in that time, one would have to grow continuously at super Eddington rate since a redshift of 30, which would be 100 million years after the Big Bang. So if one would want to explain this black hole um, through just accretion, so growth through accretion of gas, then one would have to allow it to accrete at a super Eddington rate. And it would have had to start accreting from a seed which appeared 100 million years after the Big Bang and had a mass of 10 to the 4 solar masses. So currently there's no theory for the existence of such seeds and also not for sustaining such an accretion rate for such a long time. Yeah. Now, the problems, therefore, uh, just as a, uh, an overview, are the following. This is the challenge which one has to uh, try to solve. How can such supermassive black holes even form? The problem is that one needs to squeeze a very large amount of um, normal matter into an extremely small space. The other problem is that why do supermassive black hole masses correlate with the masses of the hosting galaxy? So there seems to be some sort of apparently co-evolution. That's how it's started currently interpreted. Um, and how can supermassive black holes form within a few 100 million years after the Big Bang? This one is related to that problem. This is a fundamental problem of even able, being able to do that. This here is the issue that one has to do it <clears throat> extremely rapidly. Yeah? And there's no physics at the moment, at least, which um, actually would explain all that. So. Um, why can a supermassive black hole seed not form from direct collapse of a post Big Bang gas cloud? The idea is uh, we have the Big Bang, the universe expanding, the gas is cooling, and then there are these overdense regions which start to collapse, and the gas um, just collapses and makes a supermassive black hole. And this, this just doesn't work. Here we have the um, post Big Bang gas clouds. Um, it's collapsing, and at some point, its opacity increases, and the radiation trapped in here can't escape, so it just heats up. Which means that at some point, if it were to collapse to a really compact state, it would become the matter would become relativistic, and that would not work. It would just explode outwards. Central relativistic gas would radiate and eject immediately. It's simply not possible to take gas and just put it together into a black hole because the matter resists. Um, so here's the um, why it ac resists. This is the um, ac an accretion luminosity. If we have a black hole which is accreting with this rate, solar masses per uh, unit time, and this here is the um, fraction of rest mass radiated. So when the matter becomes relativistic, it stops to radiate, and um, that's um, super Eddington, and this is then the normal Eddington. So super Eddington means that we are actually dumping more mass onto the, we are losing less mass um, through radiation than one would maybe usually expect. And now the radiation pressure will shut off accretion. So if you have a black hole which is growing and the gas is falling into it, it starts to radiate, and that radiation stops the inflow. And so this is self-regulation where the uh, black hole throttles the amount of mass which can get onto it per unit time, and that's why it's difficult to form black holes. So this has been calculated, and uh, one can calculate um, at which rate the black hole mass increases. So that's the uh, an exponential increase here with these uh, quantities here, and um, that's what you will find on Wikipedia and <laughs> the literature, so that's nothing new here. But it means that, for example, if we start with a black hole seed of 10 solar masses, so that would, for example, be the remnant of a uh, massive first star, uh, and to reach a mass of 10 to the 10 solar masses um, as a supermassive black hole, one would have to accrete for 1 billion years at a super Eddington rate, and then continuously, right? And that's physically very difficult to, uh, to do. Uh, and so this actually doesn't really do uh, work. Um, 
in any case, such a cloud would still make a, would first make a star cluster. It's not like this cloud would collapse into a single point. It would break up into individual stars and then would make a star cluster. And that's the key. That's the actual key to the solution, the star cluster. Now, um, so how can one make supermassive black holes? And that's where we uh, started, uh, uh, where, where we had the ansatz here. Um, one needs to efficiently compactify matter to a black hole seed. How does one do that? Well, there's a very standard way. Um, we form a star. Well, that is, we know that that happens also at very low metallicity. Uh, the massive star would typically um, evolve to a black hole um, after some 50 million years or shorter, leaving a remnant, or if it completely uh, implodes, it's even, even easier than, than this black hole would correspond to about this mass. If it, uh, it goes through a supernova um, uh, explosion, it loses a large fraction of it, but still leaves a black hole um, about of this mass, where this is the mass of the, uh, uh, of the star. So uh, this is very efficient. We know this happens, um, and it happens on a fairly short time scale of less than about 50 million years. That's about the last time, the last uh, supernova exploding when a, a least massive um, star would explode as a supernova um, type 2 or co collapse supernova. So then in the star cluster, if, if we have a star cluster of these, then we end up with a cluster of black holes. And then we can, in principle, just merge these black holes to make a more massive black hole. And there's a huge literature on this uh, by various people. Um, and uh, we know that this is highly efficient because there's essentially negligible mass loss. So when we two combine two black holes, that is nearly, nearly up to a few percent the sum of the black masses of these black holes. And this is very nicely um, evident from uh, these uh, LIGO uh, measurements, uh, where here these are the uh, gravitational wave events which have been this, uh, detected. So for example, this black hole here merged with that black hole over there, and that produced a black hole of this combined mass. And that, you see, is nearly equal to the sum of these two. And this is the case for all of these. So the loss of a mass from the combination of two black holes is quite negligible, it's just a few percent. And so that's a very efficient way to uh, create a bigger black, black holes just to get two smaller black holes together. So this is promising. How do we, however, merge more than 10,000 black holes sufficiently quickly? Because remember, we have to make these very massive, uh, supermassive black holes within a few hundred million years of the uh, first stars which formed within the first of the, of, of the Big Bang, essentially. So can one arrange that? But, so we have this following situation. We have the star cluster which forms at the center of a major galaxy which is just starting to form. Um, this star cluster leaves within 50 million years a cluster of uh, less massive stars. These are these red ones here plus the black holes, which come from the blue, the massive stars in the star cluster. So this goes quite quickly. The problem now is, can we get this object to form that object where the black holes have merged to make one single um, massive, supermassive black hole, even a supermassive seed black hole would be quite useful. The question is, how long would this, would, would this take? So we have this problem going from here to there, and we need to know how long does this take? Because if we can do this quickly, then we've solved the problem, basically, at least part of the problem, because we have solved the problem of making supermassive black holes very quickly. Stellar dynamical modeling shows such a cluster to be stable. This is very bad news. So um, here's a um, seminal paper by um, Mira Girsch and Rainer Spurzem, um, where um, they plot um, the scaled radius versus the time in units of the two body relaxation time. So what you're seeing here on this axis is a time scale in many billions of years, unfortunately, you could say. So the star class, this is the half mass radius and this calculation begins at the, with a realistic um, half mass radius. Um, and this is the core radius of the cluster. Now, what happens in such a system is that it, as it starts to evolve, uh, the stars exchange energy and um, through gravitation, through many weak gravitational encounters, this is, this is called two-body relaxation. And this drives us, or the, the system wants to evolve towards energy equipartition. The problem with self-gravitating systems is that when, um, when, a, a when a star loses energy uh, through an encounter, it falls towards the potential and speeds up and it actually gets, um, acquires kinetic energy, which it can then share with the other stars through other encounters. 
and so uh, this means that the the system um, um, collapses part of the population of stars collapses that's this collapse of the core here that's an a, essentially a gravothermal instability here uh, because of this negative negative specific heat capacity of the system and the rest of the star cluster absorbs the energy which the core creates so the core shrinks because of this um, what i've just said um, um, the star which loses energy falls towards the center speeds up and therefore can uh, shed even more energy to the surroundings so the core forms and the cluster expands and you can see as the core reaches a high density what then happens is correlations form so two stars through the many triple encounters one forms binaries and the binaries then are internal energy sources so another encounter will sh shoot out a star and the binary will shrink and another encounter will shoot out another star and the binary will shrink even more and so once binaries form the core stabilizes it creates energy kinetic energy through binaries which form in the core and they absorb the potential energy and slowly shrink or are even ejected from the cluster while this binary is ejecting other stars. So the binary is ejected, another binary forms, or there is already a binary, and so this continues. And the core can never reach a density to actually make a black hole from many black holes. And so this has been shown. Uh, so these correlations form through three body encounters in the dense central parts of the cluster. The binaries heat the rest of the cluster, like the nuclear reactions in stellar interiors, actually. And this is called balanced evolution. Therefore, um, this has shown these calculations and many thereafter have shown that this doesn't work. You know, we cannot take a normal star cluster with black holes and actually uh, form a, a massive black hole within, um, within um, a few, um, within a, say, a few hundred million years. One can form an intermediate mass black hole, but this takes billions of years. Yeah? So this actually doesn't help us. In, the, uh, in solving the set of problems um, mentioned at the beginning of the talk. So clusters of black holes cannot evolve to supermassive black hole seed within about 200 million years. This is, just doesn't work. So one could say, okay, bad luck, and yet again, we do not understand the pro uh, we don't understand how to solve the problem. The solution actually is very simple. The solution um, need in, um, involves that we have to put what we've just heard into the context of galaxy formation and evolution. However, not in what you've already been hearing all along concerning dark matter subhalos merging. That doesn't work. It works, however, if you take the observational evidence um, at hand. So in this uh, contribution, what we did is we just took what these people at the Canary Islands have been telling us, as well as others. It was actually started with Francesca Matteucci, I should say. She was, I think, the first one realizing that elliptical galaxies must have formed very quickly, in fact, with a top-heavy IMF. So they essentially um, a vast amount of observational of observations have now informed us that these spheroids form through essentially a monolithic collapse with some maybe accretion emerges later but essentially the body the bulk of such an elliptical end bulge form through the collapse of an of, of a of a post big bang gas cloud that's the only uh, interpretation we have for the data so here we have an, a simulation of this uh, by wittenburg uh, et al um, this shows the evolution over 10 billion years of a sp initially spherical gas cloud with a mass of 10, nearly 10 to the 9 solar, 10 to the 10 solar masses, starting with a radius of 20 kiloparsecs um, and with some rotation in it. So this is a gas cloud which condensed out of the um, expanding universe after the Big Bang and it's now starting to collapse under self-gravity with some rotation because of the talking from the surrounding matter field. Now, Actual elliptical galaxy formation simulations are underway by uh, Robin Erpen et al. in Prague. Uh, this was work done in uh, Bonn. And so here's a simulation from the Wittenberg uh, paper. Uh, this is the gas cloud with a radius of 20 kiloparsecs seen uh, from the top. It's rotating in the plane and you can see what happens. It collapses, makes a central uh, uh, dense object, and then it just forms a rotating disk galaxy in this case, which actually um, because it's got rotation. And so if we, and then it just continues and these objects um, are very realistic. So the, the density profile and so on, and that's covered in that research paper up there. Now, look at the time scale. This collapses and there at 200 million years, we have the first central starburst essentially. 
Yeah, and that's uh, basically what we're talking about. So there's, the stars begin to form at the center while the rest of the system is collapsing and right at the beginning. But in the first million years, we have a very massive star cluster right at the center. And that's the key. So um, the first formed very metal poor, extremely massive starburst star cluster forms at the center of the future spheroid. The whole galaxy, like M87, took some billion, maybe two billion years to assemble in bulk. But at the center, it started to form stars just as soon as the gas which was collapsing uh, was cool enough to collapse, which is some few hundred billion years after the, uh, after the Big Bang. And so such a star cluster, we can calculate the mass, it would be of the mass of 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9 solar masses, because the gas is just dumping onto the center part and it's forming stars vigorously. Uh, at some point, there are so many stars, there's so many massive stars, because we have a top heavy IMF, I'll come to that later, produce such a radiation field that the in very internal part within the internal maybe tens, 20 or so parsecs shields itself through radiation. The gas is then um, uh, pushed out. However, at, uh, the surroundings are still collapsing and, and, and forming this whole uh, spheroid, right? So this central cluster with the um, um, massive stars, the ionizing stars, um, produce an extreme radiation field and outwards wind stops gas inflow from surrounding forming spheroids. Um, now this wind reaches some thousands of kilometers per second. It's very metal rich because these massive stars begin to produce a huge amount of metals through the supernova explosions, but also stellar collisions. So the first formed hypermassive starburst cluster was quantified by uh, this work by Teresa Yarabkova uh, et al. And um, this is uh, what we calculated. We have here the bolometric luminosity as a function of time in the millions of years. So this here is the time when the object forms, the very first very massive cluster. So up here, for example, you've got a star cluster which weighs uh, 10 to the 9 solar masses. This is equivalent to an ultra compact dwarf galaxy. The, the very large number of massive stars in it reach luminosities which approach 10 to the 13 solar luminosities and then it falls down as the stars evolve and today such an object looks very much like a new ultra compact dwarf galaxy except that this particular case is at the center of a galaxy but similar objects form if they are ejected or in uh, strongly interacting galaxies we, could, we, we observe such massive clusters in this mass range here to be forming in um, in the um, interacting galaxies, which can then be actually ejected from the galaxies or lost from the galaxies and keep orbiting as ultra compact dwarf galaxies. So this here is the luminosity of ultra compact dwarf galaxies. And that's where these systems uh, evolve into. Now, um, so we you can see that these type of objects, so this here is one with 10 to the uh, nine, uh, eight solar masses. This one here is with 10 to the seven solar masses. Uh, these various lines are for different IMFs. So this here is a top heavy IMF, which means it's very bright beginning and then it loses a lot of mass because of the massive stars evolving and it ends up less massive than a, than a uh, corresponding object which formed with a normal IMF. So this would be a canonical IMF, the green one canonical IMF, which um, also has many uh, massive stars, but then not as many. And so it loses a less, a smaller fraction of its mass through stellar evolution, but still ends up in this uh, UCD uh, regime. Now, the, the point is that these type of objects um, would correspond to quasars in the luminosity. Now, if they are at a very high redshift, um, they very much, they very well might be mistaken for uh, quasars. Well, this is quasi-stellar, um, quasi-stellar um, radiating object or quasi-stellar object, a star, quasi-star. <laughs> anyway, so this comes from quasi-star, so this is actually like a star. Right? It's a very point, very small, 10, 20 parsecs in radius at a redshift of 8, 9, and so it very much would look like a quasar, driving a very rapid, strong wind with um, uh, uh, very metal enriched. Uh, and so these are, we call, Irabkova objects, and the hope is that they might be discovered with the uh, uh, JWST um, in the future. And so we have this um, Yarabkova object, which is now shut of further accretion of gas onto it, most likely. And um, so for 50 million years, such an object um, 
has the luminosity of 10 to the 12 solar luminosities and it drives a metal rich outflow at about two solar masses per year and a few thousand kilometers per second, if not more. So these are rough estimates. Nobody has done really detailed hydrodynamical calculations of these type of, uh, of, of objects. That's still to be done. I think it's a very interesting research uh, problem to work on. Now, these objects might well be mistaken for very, very high redshift uh, quasars. So uh, we have this object. It then evolves within 50 million years to a star cluster full of stellar mass black holes. And when that happens, the radiation field, of course, stops. And when that radiation field stops, the gas from the still forming spheroid, remember, we are only at 50 million years since the beginning, the whole galaxy forms on a time scale of a billion years or more. This is an elliptical galaxy, right? And so the central bubble collapses and the gas dumps right into the uh, center. And that's now the question, can this shrink because of the gas infall and form a supermassive black hole seed? And if, you know, can one, errant, how long does this process take? That's basically now the question. So black hole cluster can be squeezed to supermassive black hole seed. And the question is, does that work? And so um, there's some uh, relevant literature to look at, which have also been addressing this issue, which uh, um, actually when, when I was leading this project, I was not aware of, I actually discovered these papers uh, when I was writing up this uh, paper. In fact, even when after it was accepted, because I, as I yet again looked at the literature and so added these, uh, these citations to, to our paper. And so um, the black hole cluster is squeezed to supermassive black hole seed which then can continue to grow by normal Eddington accretion as long as the spheroid keeps forming. Because um, this, um, if this happens sufficiently fast, we still have some 500 million years time from the rest of the spheroid forming and still gas falling into the central region to grow the seed to the actual supermassive black hole. And in that phase, it would be a normal quasar. So we've calculated um, how long this might take. We have here the energy of the cluster with n black holes and containing a certain amount of gas that's the radius of that black hole and um, this is the velocity dispersion of the n black holes in this cluster so we've got the black holes which are moving around and that corresponds to binding energy um, this corresponds to a velocity dispersion here uh, which is um, this uh, equation here so that's just the total mass the gas plus the amount of black holes in the cluster and this is the radius um, of the cluster and um, we can differentiate this to get um, an equation for the rate of change of the radius of this cluster given that there is this uh, gas it it has a time changing energy and the time changing energy comes from uh, the heating through the binaries what i mentioned before so when it collapses binaries form and these binaries start heating the the the, the cluster the heating through the binaries opposes shrinkage that's a problem because the binaries might simply stop this shrinkage, even though we have gas drag, which helps. So this here is the uh, loss of the uh, or gain in binding energy through gas drag or von der Hoyle accretion, which is uh, essentially the same thing in this context. And so we can solve this equation. We can, we can calculate how our, the radius of the cluster evolves. We can calculate how the velocity dispersion changes with time and uh, estimate, calculate that time when this velocity dispersion reaches 1% of the speed of light. When that happens, the cluster is so compact that the black holes, when they pass each other, radiate gravitational waves, and then it just collapses through gravitational wave radiation. Then nothing can stop the collapse anymore. And so this is the uh, one result. For example, we have a cluster of black holes, each weighing 50 solar masses. It contains um, as much gas in the cluster as much mass in the cluster as is in uh, black holes so e per g is one it starts with one parsec radius and we have a hundred thousand black holes and this is what happens with the radius this is the time the radius actually shrinks because although there is the heating through binaries of black holes which resists uh, opposes the shrinkage um, the gas drag is sufficient even though we only have as much gas in the cluster as there are black holes and so the object uh, shrinks here the black holes stop being energy sources because the black holes are now so tight the black hole binding so tight that when um when such a tight binding black holes it shrinks it, it merges through gravitational wave emission 
before it has another encounter and so they can't heat the cluster anymore the cluster then just shrinks even faster and this is when it reaches the relativistic states the velocity dispersion becomes one percent of the speed of light and then the thing just collapses within a few dozen million years especially the core collapse time in this case uh, aided by dissipation from the gravitate from the gravitational wave so this here is just the evolution of the uh, velocity dispersion um, the, the binary heating is uh, this one here, and this is the velocity dispersion from, um, of the cluster. You can see at this point they are equal. The binary is now um, stopping energy sources, and then uh, this velocity dispersion skyrocks, and the thing becomes relativistic, radiates a burst of gravitational waves over some 10 million years, and becomes a supermassive black hole. So we found uh, solutions. This is the solution space here. Um, where um, we um, are putting the initial radius of the black hole cluster versus the black hole cluster mass. Uh, and so, for example, if we start with a black hole cluster of one solar mass weighing um, something like 100,000 solar masses, if the black holes uh, are composed of uh, 10 solar mass black holes and with an equal amount of gas in the cluster, then it will shrink to a supermassive black hole within 100 million years, within in fact less than 100 million years. This series between 100 and 300 million years. And so there's a whole solution space where this goes within a few hundred million years, such a system would just collapse to supermassive black hole. This region here is relativistic right from the beginning. So a cluster in this part is already uh, gravitationally unstable and collapses through um, gravitational wave emission. So this is for that combination of parameters here we have, for example, a case where the black holes have masses of 100 solar masses, again, an equal amount of gas in the cluster. This here might be relevant for zero metallicity gas. So the first population three stars which form leave very massive black holes. So this is this case, you can see that the solution range increases dramatically. In fact, it becomes very easy to form a supermassive black hole within a few hundred billion years even with a modest amount of gas within the cluster. We can even reduce this amount of gas to only 10% because the thing is that when there's the gas and the black holes are moving in, they, they accrete the gas. Once they accrete, they start shining and that blows the gas out. So we could say the situation is complicated, but on average, we might be between this number and that number. So between only a small fraction of the total mass being in gas and the same amount of the uh, um, and, um, of mass in gas as in black holes. But you can see that the solutions are still very um, good. So we still have a large range of parameter space where, the, where this cluster of black holes collapses to a supermassive black hole. The blue region is a region which collapses on more than a billion year time scale or even expands because of a binary, star, binary black hole heating. Okay, So this region is less interesting for us. That's more what we would find in normal star clusters, but this regime clearly solves essentially the, pro the problem. Now you can see that there are no solutions at this low mass end. If we start with a star cluster, with a cluster with black holes in this regime here, we do not get a supermassive black hole. And this has consequences, actually very, very important. So, um, Evolution of the black hole clusters gas infalls is therefore clear. Um, the shrinkage to relativistic regime within 200 million years of the black hole cluster formation happens. Then once the cluster, the black hole cluster is in that regime of gravitational wave instability, at least 5% of it collapsed to the central supermassive black hole seed, as these uh, previous calculations have actually shown. There's quite a remarkable a study of this type of system. Um, so they start with relativistic clusters and then they evolve within a few million years to um, have 5% of the black hole cluster merge to a uh, supermassive black hole seed. And so um, a supermassive black hole seed weighing more than 5% of the black hole cluster is possible within 200 to 300 million years of the formation of the first stars. What about the correlation between the supermassive black hole and host galaxy mass? Remember this diagram? Uh, that's, can this model explain this? Well, it actually does, most remarkably, um, because the, the clue is, remember, that the, uh, the central cluster forms in the whole galaxy. 
Okay, so easy, actually. One has to use the IGMF theory, which comes uh, to hand very nicely here. So um, the total mass in stars formed in a galaxy over the time delta t is this here. Is the total mass is equal to star formation rate of the galaxy times delta t. That's a very simple equation. Okay, ten solar masses per year for uh, a million years uh, give give us a corresponding mass in stars. Ten, 10 to the seven, if I haven't made a mistake. So um, ten to the seven solar masses in stars, easy, right? So now this total mass, which is formed in this time delta t in the galaxy with the star formation rate, is distributed over a whole population of star clusters. This is the mass function of star clusters, and this is the mass of a star cluster, embedded star cluster. So uh, this is the uh, IMF of star clusters, and we now in need to integrate over all the star clusters which formed in this uh, time delta t. And so we have a relation between the star formation rate of the galaxy and the most massive cluster which can form in this system, just by solving this equation here. This two equation, this equation. This here is about a Taurus Auriga type star formation event of little groups of stars of five solar masses. We also know that there's one most massive cluster between this mass here, this mass up here, and a theoretical upper limit, which could be something like 10 to the 10 solar masses. That's actually not critical. And so by solving these equations together with this, we get, we find that this most massive cluster here. And, and here depends on the star formation rate of the galaxy. It's a one-to-one -one relation. Actually, it was published in 2004 and then readdressed in Randria Manakoto at the end in 2013. Now, the delta T we know from observations is about 10 million years. That's the time li lifetime of molecular clouds. So molecular cloud forms, spawns some star embedded clusters, which then become part of the field. A new molecular cloud forms about 10 million years later and does the same thing. And so we expect the first cluster to be the most massive and most metal poor. In fact, zero metallicity, if it's the very first one. And it forms at the center of the later host galaxy. And it will be dominated by massive stars because of the top heavy IMF under these conditions. So we know from the work of Dabringhausen et al. and Marx et al. Um, that the IMF uh, becomes top heavy with increasing density and decreasing metallicity. Okay, so this is the cartoon. We have here the number of stars versus stellar mass. Here are brown dwarfs. This is the two part canonical IMF. That's a salpeter slope here. And as we increase the density and decrease the metallicity, we get a more and more top heavy IMF. And this has been quantified uh, in, in this uh, research paper here. And so we can calculate, depending on the density, uh, um, how massive the first cluster would have been, given uh, and which how many black holes it leaves. So, for example, a star cluster with 10 to the 8 solar masses would form a black hole cluster with a mass of some nearly 10 to the 7 or more solar masses. This is, again, the canonical IMF. And this is the top heavy IMF from Marx et al. So there is some difference, but it's not uh, a very huge uh, difference. It's only maybe a factor of 10 difference in the black hole mass for a given born star cluster. Don't mind the blue curves, that's an intermediate regime. So this is uh, these objects are consistent with the dynamical mass to light ratios of massive star clusters and ultra compact dwarf galaxies. There's a nice research paper showing that in uh, here, Mahani et al. And so uh, we now have um, the mass of this cluster strongly correlates with later host galaxy mass. This is the mass of the present day galaxy, like M87. And that's the most massive cluster which formed at the center of the galaxy when this galaxy started to form. Now, we have the star formation of the galaxy, which is about the present day mass of the galaxy, divided by the time the galaxy needed to form. And we have given that we now know the star formation rate for the galaxy which we observe today and we know how long it took to form, we know which mass of the star cluster formed in the center of this cluster, the first cluster. This delta tau is the downsizing time. That's the time it takes to form these elliptical galaxies. So uh, the famous work by Thomas et al. 
and Eto Reki et al. and now uh, Jan et al. Um, where one has estimated from uh, some uh, spectroscopic survey of elliptical galaxies the metallicity, the ages of the stars, and the alpha element abundance. These together tell us how quickly these galaxies must have formed. And so we know that the galaxies, which today weigh something like 10 to the 12 solar masses, formed on a time less than a billion years, and something like half a billion years. Galaxies, elliptical galaxies, which weigh something like 10 to the 10 solar masses, would have formed over time of something like a billion years. And uh, so this is the time scale of formation of these systems as a function of the mass, and this is the star formation rate. So galaxy with this mass today would have formed with a star formation rate of something like 10,000 solar masses per year over half a billion years. And this has been confirmed by a large number of research publications using various methods. And so these timescales are very robust. They might be out by a factor of two or so, but overall the downsizing issue is today very well established. And here's an, an, a nice result from ALMA observations of quasar host galaxies at this high redshift here, about 1.2 billion years after the Big Bang. And yes, one sees such star formation rates. So, uh, I, I cannot explain all the details here, but um, this is the star formation rate observed at that redshift with various methods, and that's the mass of the object they see, this, the, the galaxy. And you can see that these galaxies, like 10 to the 11 solar masses, there are cases with star formation rates which reach nearly 10,000 solar masses per year. So um, this is quite a, a realistic scenario. And so we obtain this is the mass of the central massive object versus the mass of the galaxy. Here we've got 10 to 12 solar masses, 10 to the 10 solar masses. These are measurements from this uh, co compilation here. So a galaxy at 10 to 11 solar masses, say this one here has this central massive black, supermassive black hole in it. If now the first cluster forms, when these galaxies were, were beginning to form, the first cluster forms, and if 5% of the black holes in the first cluster merge within 300 or so million years, then we get this relation here. The, there are no black hole forms here, and that's because I remember I pointed out the regime where no black holes, form, supermassive black holes form, that's this gap here. Here we do not have supermassive black hole formation, only here. If, um, however, all the black holes merge in this first cluster, then we come to this relation. Note that automatically the slope is equal to the slope of the observed data. This is a most remarkable, um, well, you could call it coincidence, but, you know, agreement with the data, which was not tuned to get to here. I mean, this comes out of the theory, IGMF theory, without any adapt, uh, parameter adjustments. If 5% of all the black holes merge in all the formed central star clusters, with the first cluster forms, then the black holes do their thing, form a supermassive black hole, probably next to it another black, another such similar cluster forms, and so on. This is just continues while the galaxy is forming. And so if we take 5% of all the black holes which formed in all the most massive central clusters, we get to this line here. This is now shallower because we now have to add um, all, the, all the clusters over the whole time of the formation of the... Um, of the uh, uh, spheroid. And if one, if all the black holes merged in all formed clusters, we get exactly the observed relation, which is quite remarkable. It's as if then when the galaxy was forming, all these black holes in the centers are uh, formed. Um, and if we squash all of them into the black hole, and we sum all of that up according to the IGMF theory, um, we get a correlation which actually agrees with what we observe in terms of the mass of the central black hole and the mass of the galaxy. Right? If we now would add all the first formed cluster, if the whole first cluster collapses, then we get this relation here. And if all the central clusters collapse, we get that relation up here, which is, of course, above the data because this would be an unrealistically efficient formation of supermassive black holes. And so, uh, remarkably, we get essentially the correct correlation. So the idea is that we end up probably somewhere in this regime. Not all the black holes merge, and not all the clusters are, are involved in the merging in the center, but um, this forms a seed within a few hundred million years, and this seed then grows to that mass through adding to an accretion within the time, within the downsizing time. So it suffices to have this accretion onto the central black hole seed 
while the uh, galaxy is forming, it then shuts off, it quenches, and then it's all finished. The quasar or the black hole doesn't continue to grow because there's no further gas inflow and we end up in this regime. And so, um, furthermore, this theory shows us that in this regime, we do not form black holes. The theory cannot form supermassive black holes. We are only left with a central cluster, but no supermassive black hole at the center. So this actually explains this very, very nicely, including the fact that there are no black holes uh, in this regime, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. And here's now for Roberto. Um, I'm starting here with assuming that 5% of the black holes merge in all the formed central clusters. So the galaxy forms, it forms all these clusters, and all the black holes, actually 5% uh, of all the black holes end up part of the supermassive black hole. Then we get this correlation here. And these are the observations which I was just showing before. And the, this dashed lines are all the formed central clusters because the central clusters would form in the central region, but then they would merge like Roberto has been showing nicely in his research. The central globular clusters by that stage would then be forming a massive nuclear cluster over the time when the um, uh, spheroid is forming. So that's this relation. These are all the formed uh, clusters, masses. You notice, Roberto, this is shallower than this relation and it's offset. And this is a, a, from the a paper from Roberto where exactly this is shown. This is quite remarkable. In fact, I discovered this just today and I made this plot uh, just before I started uh, this presentation. So you can see this is a very nice uh, a contribution by Capuzzo Dolcetta and uh, Tosta Emelo that they showed that the supermassive black holes have this correlation, which is steeper but with the mass of the uh, uh, galaxy. And the nuclear clusters, they continue the correlation like uh, Harris uh, has, has, has published before, however offset. So they are above the supermassive black correlation and at a shallower slope. And the IGMF theory explains it quite nicely. So I'm, I'm nearly finished now. Um, we have automatically obtained an explanation for the shallower slope of the nuclear cluster versus host relation. And this was not anticipated. Yeah? This was not put into the theory. It actually comes out of these calculations. So the appearance of the first quasars, actually, we, we can calculate now from, um, from knowing how many elliptical galaxies exist and when they formed from the work of Thomas et al. And we estimate this density, co-moving density of black holes. These are the hypermassive clusters, which look like quasars as a function of time. And these are the actually accreting supermassive black holes which form from these hypermassive clusters. And you can see that the densities quite agree with the observed densities of quasars at a very high redshift. You can see the redshift from Young et al. And so the conclusions are as follows. Um, I think, um, how can supermassive black holes even form? Primarily through coalescence of many stellar black holes driven by gas infall onto the central black hole cluster. Why do supermassive black hole masses correlate with the mass of the hosting galaxy? Essentially through the downsizing time, the Thomas time, and the, the IGMF theory. And how can supermassive black holes form within a few hundred billion years after the Big Bang? The high Z quasars are hypermassive starburst clusters with top heavy IMF, the Irapkova object, which will be tested for with the JWST. And essentially, given the standard properties of normal matter, the observed downsizing time, the correlations of the stellar population with downsizing time observed in elliptical galaxies and bulges, quasars in fact must appear about 200 billion years after the Big Bang, just by standard physics, as hypermassive starburst clusters, these are the Jirakova objects, and supermassive black holes must correlate with the host galaxy as a consequence of just completely standard physics, of course, coupled with general activity. And so that concludes my uh, presentation um, and thank you for uh, listening and apologies for being a little bit uh, over time, I think. So. Okay. Thank you, Pavel, for the nice, elegant presentation. And so I'm here asking, first of all, to the audience here in the in the hall and after that to all the people who are listening remotely to this talk if they have questions or comments that we would appreciate to together 
Are there comments or questions from the remote participants? I see there is a pretty high number of people listening from somewhere. <laughs> so they are invited to ask questions if they have. If they are thinking about, I would like to, to ask you something, uh, Pavel. And uh, the question is related. I'm, I, I see that it is very nice that you, in your model, you have a, a two population. I mean, a compact singularity population in the sense you for the massive because of matter essentially goes into a singularity, while for a less massive uh, host, uh, uh, the, the matter does not reach singularity, so for uh, remain in the form of a super cluster or nuclear cluster or, or whatever. Yeah. Yes, the red dot. Mm -hmm. And do you think that you have a possibility uh, to, to go in such a details in your simulation to see whether the, the, the massive clusters which uh, are hosted by not very massive galaxies uh, have uh, structures which are similar to what are actually observed with, with what actually are the red points, which are the nuclear star cluster in the sense uh, kind of, of densities, because a nuclear star cluster characterized by high mass, also high density. So we know more or less what are the characteristic parameters. So is it possible to, to, to go into these details with your models? I see that the, the, the slope is good. But the slope is a sort of, uh, I mean, uh, something co connected to the correlation between Austin mass and Austin mass. Yeah. You think that actually your objects are similar to the real nuclear star cluster observed in the galaxy? Yeah. Well, um, I, th um, I, I think so. By, by implication, one, one wouldn't, we, one, we haven't uh, done the explicit calculation, but you have uh, yourself done that, right? <laughs> you, uh, so the, in the central regions, uh, if there were a number of massive clusters, they would merge through dynamical friction on the rest of the uh, you know, stellar population, the, the inner part of the spheroid. They would just shrink to the center, sink to the center, and then they would merge and build up a more massive a nuclear cluster. And I think this uh, actually works uh, very nicely. Um, um, so I don't, you know, one can, one could continue. Well, it would be nice to do a simulation, as I've shown you before, uh, where we start with the gas clouds, uh, have subparsec resolution with stellar feedback, and actually do that sort of uh, calculation to actually measure in that simulation. The amount of mass falling to the central region that, um, to actually resolve these clusters um, or the more massive ones. Uh, I think this is in principle possible on supercomputers. We have the technology to do that, um, but um, it would have to be um, arranged to be done. So we would need somebody to do the calculations, you know, funding and all that. <laughs> but it's definitely possible. I think there's a promise for a lot, a lot of uh, additional work um, on on this very issue which you've just raised um okay thank you thank you Pat. other questions students please go ahead don't be shy i have one question okay, now, okay? so um so the, the the idea that you propose is essentially that um so what is really working is that you have this strong gas info onto the the central cluster right and so I have several questions, but the first, the first one is, so do you think that uh, since we already see at Redshift 6 smaller black hole masses, do you think that uh, the formation route of these smaller black holes uh, is the same or you envisage a different uh, formation mode for these um, lighter <laughs> supermassive black holes at high Redshift? And um, the additional thing is, um, is um, how can you uh, envisage to actually have these very massive galaxies forming uh, um, at such high redshift? So um, if you can, you know, give us a little bit more details on, 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 on the galaxy evolution scenario that you have in mind. And my third <laughs> question is, um, how can you disprove your scenario? Is there, there is any, you know, clear observations that would, uh, exclude 
um, uh, the, the, the scenario that you are proposing? Yeah, so the last one is uh, very relevant. Uh, the others too, but I can start with it because I still have it in my memory. So, um, yes, that can be disproved because you see this histogram here. This shows us, uh, according to these calculations, that the first, so this year, at, at a very high redshift here, redshift of 9.5 or so, we, we expect a certain number of quasars, but they would not be accreting supermassive black holes, but um, very very massive star clusters okay so in fact there's a time when there's no supermassive black hole yet because it hasn't formed yet however we we already see quasars and those are uh, these very massive star clusters so if one can find a distinction between the hypermassive starburst cluster which has a luminosity of a quasar um, and an actual accreting supermassive black hole, um, then this could disprove the model. So if we can show that supermassive black holes are truly there as quasars um, right at the beginning, so to be speaking, then, um, then uh, this model, which needs this phase of the very massive cluster for the first 50 million years or so, uh, would be disproven. So that is a possibility. That's why I'm very keen to hopefully see J, JWST observations of the very, very high redshift universe to maybe hopefully provide some information on this. So that, that's a avenue to actually disprove this uh, particular model. Um, the, uh, I think the second question uh, was the uh, galaxy formation uh, uh, scenario, right? How does one understand um, this? Uh, in terms of uh, galaxy formation, well, uh, you see, the, the, and this is where we where things become uh, problematic because, uh, from my point of view, it's uh, uh, completely uh, trivial. It's easy. That's just what happens. So, there might have been, you know, there's a big bang. There's uh, the gas which is cooling, and it would collapse. The question is, um, we know from standard uh, calculations that um, this doesn't work in the normal. Um, gravitational framework, you need the dark matter to, 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 to help structure formation. And the dark matter messes things up in this case because the dark matter starts making uh, these small halos um, before, um, before the gas cools. Uh, and then when the gas sufficiently cool, it falls into these small halos. So you get these dwarf galaxies forming, which then merge uh, and uh, build up ever larger structures. So we get the merger tree and then this doesn't work. Yeah? I mean, uh, because you just don't have uh, this goes so observationally we see these events to go too quickly this model also requires it to go quickly in the standard model this it's a, a real problem to form these very massive galaxies so incredibly fast yeah this i think actually isn't isn't even possible because you need time to form f first uh, the smaller dark matter halos which then combine to the larger ones um so that's the uh, the problem. Uh, so the way I view this, of uh, you know, the, I, I think I'm, I'm I should be known for this now. That of course I know that there is no dark matter, um, and I know this not from some opinion or feeling, but through the many tests which my own research has been doing, and also the um, uh, uh, collaborators and research group has been doing. Uh, there is no dark matter and the reason is dynamical friction we do not see the decay of um, satellite orbits or the decay of intacting galaxies like the um, m81 group um, we don't see the effect of chandrasekha dynamical friction on the extended dark matter halos so there is no dark matter therefore it must be something like mont so with mont we can do calculations it's in fact the only theory which we can put into a computer to solve the equations of motion at the moment because it has a generalized Poisson equation which we can solve and in that framework this is perfect it just works wonderful i was we were not allowed to put that clearly into the research paper the referee uh, had issues or problems with that but um, it's a fact i've shown that simulation of the collapsing gas cloud that's a mount calculation i didn't mention it i didn't <laughs> i didn't actually want to go on to that topic but uh, since you asked about the galaxy formation uh, so uh, in a mount universe with a big bang the gas clouds collapse very rapidly it's mount uh, and they form these massive elliptical galaxies very very quickly and of course um, there's absolutely no issue um, with the observations as far as we can tell today uh, okay. so thank you pavel i think that this would require a completely <laughs> different uh, talk yeah. and i see that there was at Shut least up. one uh, one other question so i would really like to I can yeah, ask. Okay. So Fabio, if Fabio, you want, you yes, can, uh, you can ask you can directly. Ask Are you there, Fabio? Yes, I'm here. Okay, fine. Can you ask question personally so, to Pavel? Yeah, so basically, so if some of these um, clusters are bright enough to 
uh, this very similar to quasars in the in sense of, of, of extreme luminosities. Why, when we follow up quasars or quasar candidates in the uh, rest frame UV, they have exactly the same properties as known quasars, so uh, emission line properties, also X ray, X ray emission. So, what are the observ expected observable properties of, this, of these clusters, mm -hmm. and why do they seem so similar to quasars? Yeah, that's that's an, uh, exactly the, the the thing, the the, the sort of issue. So with that, uh, one could maybe disprove this model um, absolutely. If, as I was saying before, right, if you, one can show that these uh, objects which populate this histogram are um, a con don't exist in nature, because here the, these are these very massive clusters, then the model uh, is dead, right? But um, the, the 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 problem I see now is that it, I'm not sure if at this very high redshift we have X-ray observations. I mean, you know, this is really um, the objects one sees there are point-like uh, sources. Uh, they are not resolved. Uh, plus, they um, they are extremely luminous. So one interprets the luminosity observed as an accretion luminosity in terms of an uh, Eddington uh, rate. And uh, from that, one quantifies the accretion rate, thinking that this is an accretion uh, accreting supermassive black holes. One has line width. Um, um, so the spectral lines give us the redshift, but also the widths tell us the outflow speed. So one thinks that there is a, a supermassive black hole which uh, accretes at that luminosity and uh, that drives an outflow of some few thousand kilometers per second. And um, um, the, 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 the possibility, though, is that such a hypermassive cluster, well, it's not a possibility, it's actually very true, such a hyper, hypermassive cluster, which uh, contains, um, say, uh, um, 100 million O stars in it, yeah, that's a scale, <laughs> it's sort of difficult to imagine, uh, but, but that uh, uh, cluster is driving a very rapid outflow, so it fills, the, the cluster fills itself with a uh, plus because the massive stars are profusely losing a gas, that this gas thermalizes within a certain region and sits there. It's not clear whether it can cool because of the uh, supernova and the radiation of these massive stars, but at the boundary it drives a very rapid outflow. This is um, this is the work which, which was done by um, um, uh, Clegg, uh, Clegg and somebody else in 1985. There was this very famous paper of, of the uh, um, velocity uh, wind wind being driven out from a, a, a star cluster or from a star burst uh, and so uh, such a wind will be very metal rich because the massive stars are even if there's no supernova they are colliding very effectively because they are to be like in binaries when they collide they expel synthesized matter in the in the outer shells and then that goes out you know as part of the wind and so, um, I mean, we haven't done detailed calculations, but qu qu um, qualitatively, I can see that such an object very much looks like a quasar. So if I take such a hypermassive cluster with that luminosity and I interpret it to be a accreting supermassive black hole, I will infer a supermassive black hole just by the property such a massive cluster has. And so we need to look at greater detail. So for example, you mentioned this uh, X-ray emission if one can find a relativistic disk within accretion disk within the object, then that would already show us that the, that there is that this quasar actually in fact is a accreting supermassive black hole and not just a cluster of a million O stars. Okay, so we we definitely need uh, much uh, improved observations of these highest redshift quasars. I mean, at this redshift, uh, we still have in this model cases where, where a quasar might be a uh, very massive cluster, but there, there we can actually, I think already, we have a, a good hope of, of checking that. So in fact, according to the calculations, they seem to be nearly equal in number density. So we might have a hope of finding very massive clusters versus actually accreting supermassive black holes in the model, which are at an, uh, a similar density. Uh, but at these very high redshifts, um, there's a time when there should be no supermassive black hole yet in this model. And that is a chance to uh, falsify uh, this, this model. Um, OK. Thanks a lot, Pavel. If there are other questions, both from uh, the local audience or from the remote audience, please. There is time for another possible question. But uh, if not, I would like to, to hand here the 
the seminar part of the uh, Pavel work, because after that there is some meeting with the students. And so I'd like to thank again Pavel for the talk. Okay. Give the word so Pavel, thank you so much. So I I, I will uh, leave you in the same room with the students, okay? And I thank all the attendants uh, for participating to, to this seminar today. And I hope to meet you soon, either in Rome or <laughs> somewhere else. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Bye. Ciao. Bye. Um,